Good morning, everyone. We bid you a very warm welcome uh, to this online service uh, from Molesworth Presbyterian Church. This morning, as many of you will know, I'm on holiday, so I'm sharing with you a service recorded recently at All Souls Church at Langham Place in London. The preacher at this service is someone that many of us will know quite well from Cookstown Bible Week 2018, and that's Dr. Chris Wright. Uh, Chris is speaking this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I've edited out a little bit of the service where they included some of their local news, but the rest of the service is there for you to enjoy, and I trust that you will find it a great blessing as you worship today. A very warm welcome to this worship service. This morning, Chris Wright will draw to a close our current sermon series, in which we've been seeing that true spirituality is all to do with our bodies, how we view our bodies and what we do with our bodies. How it aches then that we're gathering this morning in spirit, but not in body. But why is true spirituality all to do with our bodies? It's because the King we worship has been bodily raised from the dead. So let's now respond to the invitation of our opening song. Let's come and rejoice in our risen King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are gathered in one heart, one voice.
whether your joy is morning sun and you can tell of battles won, or if you've been weeping through the night and are struggling in the fight, all of us are in need of that mercy of which we've just been singing. And this is to be found as we come together to the foot of the cross. Join with me in the collective responses as they appear on the screen. Most merciful Father, we have sinned against you and are guilty before you. Forgive us the sins of our tongues. For deception and untruthfulness in our dealings with others, for resentment, coldness, impatience, and tempers out of control. Forgive us the sins of our eyes, for impurity in our glances and imagination, for desiring more comfort, status, and wealth than you have given us. Forgive us the sins of our hearts, for hardness of heart toward you and our neighbors, for pride, self-absorption, self-pity, and above all, for rebelling against your Lordship and doubting your love. Most merciful Father, by your Spirit, graciously renew us in the likeness of your Son, that we would live holy and pure lives to your praise and glory. Amen. If we truly confess our sins, seeking the Lord's forgiveness, we can rest in his assurance. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Kate Sharp will now bring us our family focus. What's God like? God is holy. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're well this morning. Lots of you will be finishing schoolwork this week, ready for the summer holidays. But for those of you who haven't been to school for a while, I wonder if you can think back to a day of school. What are some of the rules that you have at school? Be kind to one another. Don't run in the corridor. Always listen to the teacher. Don't talk when the teacher is talking. I wonder, have you ever thought, why do we have rules? Why do we need to be told what we can and can't do? Well, the Bible tells us that in our hearts, we are sinful. We need help to do the right thing because really we want to do the wrong thing. But do you know something, boys and girls? God is not like us at all. God doesn't need rules because he is perfect. The Bible has a special word for God. He is holy. A long time ago, the prophet Isaiah saw some angels and they were calling to one another saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In those days, if you said something once, it was true. If you said it twice, it was really true. If you said it three times, it was so really true that you had to sit down and really think about it. God is holy, holy, holy. Holy means different, special, perfect. But we are sinful and sinful people can't go near a holy, holy, holy God. So God has given us a great picture to help us understand why. In the Old Testament, God's people built a temple. In the middle of the temple was a throne. This was God's seat. This is where God lived. In front of the throne was a huge curtain, three stories high, as thick as a man's hand. It was a massive curtain. This was God's way of saying, I live behind this curtain because I am holy. Because of your sin, you can't come close to me. It's dangerous. If you were to go through this curtain, dead.
The curtain was there to keep us safe by reminding us that God is holy, 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 and we are not. That he is different to us. This means that if I want to come near to God, I need to be holy too. We need God to take our sin away to make us holy like him. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. Do you remember what happened at the very moment Jesus died? The sky turned black and something else happened. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Not bottom to top, top to bottom, because God himself tore it. Now there was a way for us to come near to God. Can you imagine slowly walking up to the throne? Can I touch it? What will happen? Do I dare go into God's throne room? Before we couldn't go near God because he is holy, holy, holy. But God has made it so we can be with him. Just walk in. Be by his throne. That's why Jesus died. God is holy. And if you're trusting in Jesus, then so are you. We're now going to sing, God is a holy God. Girls, follow me. Boys, follow Jamie. We continue bowed before the throne as we now bring our concerns to the King of Kings. The Clifton family will lead us in prayer. Good morning. We ask that you join us for a few short prayers this morning. Heavenly Father, in these times of great turmoil, we ask that you watch over those in society that are most vulnerable. As the coronavirus continues its rapid spread across the globe and prevents us from meeting in person, we pray the church's outreach services for the homeless and needy will continue. We ask those, we ask that you keep those that are in harm's way safe. We pray for the persecuted church and we give you thanks for the colleagues of our brothers and sisters in Iran. We praise you that your number of believers is growing and we pray that many more Iranians would turn to Christ. We ask that you would sustain, it, sustain, encourage and comfort Christians who are serving. Prison sentences for refusing to renounce Christ. We pray for our political leaders this morning and ask that their decisions benefit 
society most vulnerable <laughs> immigrants and those without a political voice we ask that you give our petition petitions wisdom and and ask that they look to you we ask that you that their heart will be remain to re reflect your will. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of our mission partners serving around the world. And today, especially ask that you would strengthen and encourage our mission partner in Central Asia. In the uncertainty and anxiety of an increase in coronavirus cases in the country where she serves, and as she waits for a new visa, we ask that she might hold on to Jesus and the hope that is in him, having confident, confidence in him and his grace for these days too. We pray for discernment and good teamwork as she and colleagues write online resources that will help people engage with God's word. Finally, Lord, we pray this morning for all souls. As our search for our new rector continues, we ask for wisdom and we ask for guidance. We ask that our hearts remain vigilant and that our mission remains focused on your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hello, good morning. My name is Josephine Zarke. Our reading for this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to start reading from verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. You'll find it really helpful to keep that chapter of 1 Corinthians 6 open in front of you because we're going to be looking at it quite closely in the next few minutes. When my wife Liz and I were teenagers some time ago, growing up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, in a Presbyterian church, the closing verses of today's text were often used in the teaching we were given about how Christians ought to live. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, 
You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And so we were told, don't do things that harm your own body. Don't smoke, don't get drunk, don't use drugs or guzzle far too much food. Don't be a lazy slob. No, your body belongs to Christ and to the Holy Spirit. So don't abuse it in harmful ways. And above all, of course, we were taught, don't use your body to have sex with your boyfriend or your girlfriend until you give your body wholly to one person alone in the bond of marriage. It was good teaching. It was wholesome teaching, biblical teaching for our own good. And by God's grace, it held us steady and saw us through six years of friendship at school and university in the liberated 1960s, and then a year of engagement before we got married. It's what the Bible taught us way back then, and it's what the Bible still teaches us all today if we're prepared to listen. Now, over these past two Sundays, we've seen that Paul is dealing with the problem of sexual immorality that was going on in the church in Corinth, meaning predominantly male heterosexual behavior in which men were having sex with women, either outside marriage or before marriage. And here, at the end of chapter 6, Paul reaches the climax of his teaching on this matter, and he focuses now on how Christians ought to think about our bodies, both rightly and wrongly. So let's look at both, starting first of all with what I'm calling Paul's body language negative. And then we'll come to his more positive points a little later. So what was going on in Corinth? Well, what was happening among Christians in Corinth, there were three probable reasons why sexual immorality was happening there. First of all, it seems that they had got hold of this distorted view of Christian freedom. Look at verse 12. Paul is quoting what some of them were saying and had written to him in a previous letter. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial, says Paul. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything, says Paul. But where did they get that idea from? Well, possibly actually from Paul himself. Because you see, Paul preached a lot about Christian freedom. Through faith in Christ, we are free, free from the tyranny of sin and death, free from slavery to the law, free from slavery to the flesh, and probably Paul had taught these Corinthians what he had earlier written to the Christians in Galatia. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. But then, you see, the believers in Corinth had distorted that to mean that they could do whatever they liked. And they forgot what Paul went on to say in the same place, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. So, yes, we are given freedom in Christ, but that's not a license to do just as we please. Some things are not beneficial, to say the least, and some things we might start out choosing freely, but then they quickly become dominating habits and addictions. And then Paul goes on to another reason for this sexual immorality in Corinth. They had not only distorted view of what Christian freedom means, they also had, secondly, a distorted view of the body. Look at verse 13. Because once again, Paul quotes what the people in Corinth were saying. It was perhaps a kind of proverb. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. And what they meant was, sex is just a bodily appetite, like food. Your body needs food, that's why you get hungry. Your body needs sex, that's why you have strong desires. But it doesn't really matter. Food is perishable, the body is perishable, we're all going to die. So what you do with your body doesn't matter anyway. You can have sex just as casually as you can enjoy a good meal. It's no big deal. It's not really a moral issue at all because sex is nothing more than a bodily function. It's a physical appetite, just, just do it. Eat when you feel hungry, have sex when you feel sexy, it's all the same. Except that it's not. Because of course our bodies are far, far more than just 
disposable food bags, and sexual intimacy between your body and the body of another human being made in the image of God is far, far more than just filling your belly with a burger and fries. So then, there's a distorted view of Christian freedom, a distorted view of the body, and then here's a third reason why sexual immorality was happening in Corinth. It seems that some of them, at least, had got a distorted view of marriage. And we come to this actually in chapter 7, in the first five verses, where, once again, Paul quotes what they were saying at the beginning of chapter 7. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, literally, not to touch a woman. But do notice the quotation marks there, since almost certainly that's what some of them were saying, not what Paul teaches. There were some super spiritual Christians who thought that all sex was sinful, and so Christians shouldn't get married at all, and if a married couple became Christians, then they should abstain from sex. But you see, that just meant that some of the Christian men, if they heard this kind of teaching and thought that they couldn't have sex with their wives or their Christian wives wouldn't let them touch them anymore, well, they felt that they needed to go and get their sex somewhere else with prostitutes or slave women, as was culturally quite common in the Greek culture, and possibly even with the acceptance and agreement of their wives. Actually, Paul warned Timothy about that kind of distorted, super-spiritual teaching in the letter he wrote to Timothy, where he says that such teachings come through hypocritical liars. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. And Paul would have included marriage and sex within marriage among those good things that were created by God. And indeed, in those first verses of chapter 7, Paul paints a beautiful picture of the symphony of marriage. Symphony actually is Paul's own word in the Greek, in which husband and wife both have equal authority over each other's bodies. It's actually the only place where Paul uses the word for authority in relation to marriage, and it's equal and reciprocal. And he says that husband and wife should normally give themselves wholly to one another in sexual love and intimacy. See, that's what God intended marriage for. That's his beautiful gift. But if people were distorting and despising marriage itself, then it's no wonder that there was sexual immorality going on outside marriage in Corinth. So then, a distorted view of Christian freedom, a distorted view of the body, a distorted view of marriage. Can you see how subtle and powerful the temptation to sexual immorality was in Corinth? And for reasons that are still around us today in our own culture, even among Christians. People might say, well, your old-fashioned rules about sex, they're all repressive and legalistic. You're insulting and infringing my personal freedom. It's my body, and what I do with my own body is up to me. It doesn't affect my spiritual life. Marriage? Oh, marriage is far too demanding. It's too restricting. I need to keep my options open. And anyway, we really, really love each other, and surely that makes it all right. But it's not all right, not according to Paul, not according to God's Word. And so we need to move on from why sexual immorality was happening in Corinth to see three reasons that Paul gives us as to why it should not happen at all among Christians. But first, let's pause for a short break. Precious silver, purify 
So we've seen three reasons why sexual immorality was happening in Corinth. Let's now look at three reasons why it should not be happening at all among Christians. Reasons actually which are just as valid today as they were in first century Corinth. And let's remember that that city was culturally just as loose and immoral as 21st century London might be today. Here's the first. For a Christian, sexual immorality violates your union with Christ. This, I think, is the most important in view of the space that Paul gives it. Take a look at the beginning and the ending of the words on the screen, that is, verses 15 to 17. Paul uses a very powerful metaphor for how we are united to Christ. He says our bodies are parts in his body, and we are united with him in one spirit, just like a husband and wife are bonded together in one flesh. It's a very strong word he uses. We are bonded, we are welded, we are glued into Christ in our whole person, body and spirit. So if you take your body and give it in sex to somebody you're not married to, you're taking Christ with you. Think what Christ is having to endure as part of his body through your body is acting in sinful disobedience to his word. The grief, the pain, the wrench, the violating of the relationship that Christ died to achieve, to bring you into union with himself. Think about that. And then secondly, sexual immorality violates your own body in verse 18. It may well be that the first part of verse 18 is another quote from what they were saying. All sins a person commits are outside the body. But Paul answers, whoever sins sexually sins against their own body in verse 18. See, some might have been saying that sex is just a bodily thing and sin is a spiritual thing. So what you do with your body doesn't really count as sin at all once you've got your soul saved. But Paul says, no, no. Your body is really you. And if you use it in a wrong and sinful way, then you're doing harm to your own self. Sexual immorality is a form of self-harm, which is also a very countercultural thought since the assumption these days is that not to have sex is repressive and harmful. And yet there is plenty of research that shows the long-term damaging personal and psychological effects of casual sex. That is, sex outside the loving commitment and the protective boundaries of marriage. And then also, sexual immorality not only violates your union with Christ and violates your own body, but thirdly, it violates the Holy Spirit within you. See, Paul adds another very powerful image in verse 19. Do you not know, he says, that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? When we became Christians, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us, making our bodies into his temple, his sacred space, his holy place, the place that should belong exclusively to him alone, to be used for his service and glory. So think about that when you use your body for anything that is not as holy as he is. So the Bible's teaching here is very clear on this. If you get involved in a sexual relationship, that is having sex in a way that is not as God intended within marriage, then you are hurting the Lord Jesus Christ, you're hurting yourself as well as somebody else, and you're hurting the Holy Spirit. This is serious. This is God's word. But what about pornography, somebody might ask? I mean, surely there's no harm in that. I mean, it's only me and myself. I'm not going to a prostitute or sleeping around. It, it isn't real. I think Paul would say, as he does in verse 9, don't be deceived. 
God sees, God knows what goes on in our imagination just as much as in our outward acts. And our imaginations have powerful control over our lives in ways that can be addictive and enslaving, as pornography undoubtedly is. And didn't Jesus explicitly say that lust in the eyes is already the sin of adultery in the heart? Which is a standard by which every one of us, us men at least, and certainly including myself, know that we are sinners in constant need of forgiveness and cleansing. And what do you mean it isn't real? Well, it may just be images on a screen to you, but those women are real. And those men who make billions from the pornography industry, they're real. And perhaps you agree that black lives matter, that black bodies matter. And perhaps you're enraged by slavery and sex trafficking. Well, then think about the fact that much pornography is explicitly racist, abusive, and enslaving. It's one of the biggest exploiters of sex trafficked women. Is that not real enough for any Christian conscience to say, no, not for my eyes, not for eyes that belong to Christ? Well, this has been a hard word to bring, a hard word to preach, first of all to myself as a sinner in need of grace. But sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. And the question is, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to listen to? The foolish wisdom of the culture all around us that leaves its trail of broken lives and fractured relationships and damaged bodies? Or the wisdom of the Lord and the clear teaching of Scripture? That's the choice you have to make when God speaks through his word. We need to pause, I think, at this moment for prayer before we turn very briefly to a more positive word. Lord, we thank you that your word cuts deeper than two-edged sword. It challenges us, but we also thank you that your word, as Paul says in this very same passage, tells us that through your Holy Spirit and through the blood of Christ, we can be cleansed and sanctified and justified. And we thank you for your grace that is available to us in your forgiveness when we repent before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn now, finally, and more positively to Paul's body language, positive. Because I'm very struck, you see, by what Paul says about the human body here. He uses this word body eight times in nine verses. And it's in a richly challenging and actually quite encouraging way. Now, of course, his main point is flee from sexual immorality in verse 18. But in saying that, Paul gives us some quite astonishingly positive truths, which were countercultural in his day and still are today. So here quickly are four remarkable statements that should help us to avoid two extremes. On the one hand, the cultural idolatry of the body that is all around us, even rather ironically in the body positivity movement. And on the other hand, helps us to avoid a false Christian denial or contempt for the body as if it was of no importance at all, which is actually being reinforced these days by the kind of disembodied online virtual life that we've all had to get used to. Here's the first. Our bodies are for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body, in verses 13 and 14. You see, Paul quotes that saying that food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food, and both are destined to perish anyway. But then he trumps it with a wonderfully surpassing statement. No, he says, the body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body, and both are destined for resurrection. God has already raised Jesus from death to resurrection life. And as Paul says elsewhere, God will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So my body is for the Lord and he is for me, me in my body. 
in all my bodily life on this earth, and then forever in my resurrection body in the new creation. That's the first thing. Isn't it wonderful? And then secondly, our bodies are members of Christ in verse 15. And again, this is a very bold metaphor because members is like limbs and organs. It's as if we are Christ's body parts, that our bodily life on earth is making real the presence of Christ here. So wherever we go, whatever we do in our bodies, we are in some way doing it all with Christ and for Christ. Well, that should make us think very carefully about our physical lives, our actions, our behavior, because our bodily life in some mysterious way is participating in Christ himself. My body is part of Christ on earth. That's an amazing thought. And then thirdly, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit in verse 19. Uh, Paul has said this already about the whole Christian church in chapter 3, verse 16, but now he says it about the individual believer. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you walked into a pagan temple in Corinth, then the whole interior of that temple was dominated by the statue of the god or the goddess whose temple it was. That image was an awesome presence that shaped the whole feel and power of that place. And in the same way, says Paul, our bodily life is to be dominated, to be characterized and shaped by the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's not just, as he said earlier, that we have the mind of Christ, but that our whole bodies are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Another amazing thought. And then finally, he says that our bodies aren't really our own. They belong to the Lord in verses 19 and 20. You see, back in verse 18, Paul says that you can sin against your own body, he says. But then he kind of subverts that by saying, well, actually, your body is not your own body. You are not your own, he says. You are bought at a price. So we don't belong to ourselves, but to the Lord and the Master who paid the price of the cross for us, so that even our bodies belong to him. You see, when a slave was bought in the marketplace in Corinth, there was a transference of ownership to the one who paid the price for him. The slave no longer belonged to his old master, nor did he now just belong to himself. No, no, he now belonged to the new pastor who had paid a price for him. And so do we bought with the precious blood of Christ. So it's no wonder that Paul comes to this wonderful climax at the end of the chapter. Therefore, he says, glorify God in your body. And where else should we do it? And the wonderful thing about this is that this is for everybody, for every body. Not just for fit and strong bodies, not just for tall and handsome bodies or slim and beautiful bodies, because bodies come, don't they, in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And God knows all about frail and wasted bodies, about aging when bits stop working or fall off. God knows about crippling injuries and disabilities and about bodily ailments and pain. But in whatever condition, our bodies can still bring glory to the God who gave them and the God who made us in his own image. So whatever body God has given you, glorify God in it today. Let's pray. God, be in my head and in my understanding. God, be in my eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking. God, be in my heart and in my thinking. God, be at my end and at my departing. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
a final prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Lord our God, send us out into this new week in the assurance of your love and in obedience to your Lordship in every area of our bodily lives. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us and those whom we love this day and always. Amen.